come in when they're ready. Okay, so um, this morning we uh, had covered a lot of ground and, and questions, which was awesome. But I also talked about calibration. Calibration is a routinely used task, uh, traditionally fairly heavy weight for, for estimating parameters and models. Today, we're going to be looking, for this afternoon, in this, in this coming talk, we're going to be looking at a, uh, a technique which is, uh, has a little bit of a different flavor. Um, and it's gonna presage techniques we'll be examining uh, for uh, stochastic systems, systems which exhibit uncertainty in how they evolve. Where we're trying to estimate, on, not parameters, but, uh, but the state of the system. What's the current state at a given time? If we're in a deterministic system, if we know the values of the parameters, then we can run it forward and we automatically know what the state of the system is. But in a stochastic system, this isn't true. Um, in a stochastic system, we may have the same parameters, but we may have different underlying situation, different state at a given time, um, because it evolves stochastically. It evolves with randomness over time. And there's a set of methods uh, that are designed to estimate the state of those systems in that condition. Broadly, these are called filtering methods. They take into account a description of how the system evolves over time, but they also take into account arriving data. And it's the observations from that data together with an understanding of the system's kind of rules of evolution that jointly give ranges of possibilities for the underlying state. And by observing things, um, you, you try to pin down what, what is the underlying state right now and project forward. And there's a whole host of techniques that we'll be exploring like this. Um, what we're about to present with hidden Markov models is the first and the simplest of those. But we'll also be looking at particle filtering and particle MCMC. And I may make some small utterances about, uh, about Coleman filtering as well, um, which together with its variants um, also provides suitable support for this process. So uh, this is the, um, the overall plan here and uh, we're going to dive into it um, with some particulars. And um, I will note that uh, this is a presentation which involves some mathematical particulars. And I recognize there's a diversity of backgrounds and interests and, um, and comfort with those mathematical particulars. Um, and as with all presentations here, I'll try to speak to the backgrounds of all people, but any given set of slides may be uh, best suited to, you know, best speak to or resonate with one group. And there'll be certain slides here that are, are mathematically more intense. And hopefully those will speak to at least some people in the boot camp, even if others, you know, try to focus instead on the on the big picture understanding of what's going on. Um, so just Fair warning here um, about that. So I'm going to share my screen and we'll see if we can get started here. So the topic is hidden Markov modeling. Um, and um, my featuring this topic reflects the fact that when we're dealing with uh, complex systems, um, there's a, a need that comes up fairly frequently um, uh, for a situation where we have some underlying system um, uh, that is that can be in one of a set of possible states um, uh, where that set is uh, is discrete. It's it's a set of possible categorical states. So maybe it's a state of being um, in an outbreak state or non outbreak state, or someone's in a mild state, they're not infected at all, they're mild, severe, or critical. Or maybe it's something to do with whether um, a given person is uh, ill with COVID or not. Um, it's, it's a set of 
nominal possibilities. Um, and accompanying this, um, we have some change in that state that applies over time. Um, and we're, where we're interested in how it evolves over time among the different states. Perhaps someone progresses, for example, from mild to, to uh, severe, but um, in some cases, but in some cases, they just continued mild for COVID-19. Or maybe it's uh, mild depression, no depression at all, a major depressive disorder. And there's possible transitions between them. But beyond that, we have a set of observations over time. So we don't just have some underlying state and its evolution stochastically. We, we have some observations over time that are individually ambiguous. They're noisy, they're sparse, maybe they're only episodically available. They're individually insufficient to identify the state. Um, and you know, any, any one observation just won't be enough to pin it down. But, but collectively, they give us some hints as to what that state is. Because certain states will have different patterns than others. So here, even if we firm, um, so, so in this case, we have this data coming in. We have some theory about how the system evolves. Um, but, uh, any one observation is not enough to identify. Even if we identify the state now, it, it may quickly change. It may evolve over time. Um, and so we may know, if we know the situation now with confidence, soon we may be less confident, absent observations. And we're looking to these observations to clue us in to what's going on in this stochastic evolution of the system between these categorical states. Um, and we're gonna seek here with confidence to infer certain things. First and foremost, in what state we are located at, at any one time. And then secondarily, the transition probabilities among these states. Um, so you could think of a situation where, for example, we're in either a state of, of outbreak or a state of non-outbreak. Um, and uh, in an outbreak state, we may have observations, maybe this is foodborne illness, for example. And we expect, you know, in an outbreak state, in general, we'll have more cases requiring people to come to a physician, clinical cases, than we would in a non-outbreak state. In an outbreak state, there's still plenty of people who need physicians' care, but we'll have somewhat more of them in our community if we have a foodborne illness outbreak going on. And similarly, in terms of people being afflicted by highly credible gastrointestinal illness or, or otherwise by, by GI distress, we might expect more in an outbreak state than in a non-outbreak state. In a non-outbreak state, we'll still have some, maybe due to alcohol use or other uses, but, but um, we'll expect more in an outbreak state. And here over time, in a given week, we might have observations, maybe partly through syndromic surveillance, uh, uh, records from physicians' offices, calls to public health, and maybe reports on smartphones of a certain number of people who are, who are ill maybe subclinically and clinically. And we want to know, is there an outbreak at a given time going on? And it bears noting that these distributions, say between outbreak and non-outbreak for clinical cases, are highly overlapped. They are not highly distinct. And so a given observation from here, let's suppose, you know, uh, in a given day, um, uh, 15 clinical cases, for example, it's more likely to be reflective of an outbreak state than an on-outbreak, but it could still be from an on-outbreak state. And similarly, if we only have, you know, uh, four or say three cases in a given day that might have resulted from a, an outbreak state, but it's more likely to be a non-outbreak state. And similarly for subclinical. 
cases. So each observation here that clues us in won't pin down definitively which state we're in right now. Over time, we might start to get some picture. Maybe, maybe we see a high value in, in this week and the neighboring week and kind of high value here. And we say, gosh, you know, that looking increasingly like an outbreak, but gosh, the system might have evolved. Maybe, maybe here we were in an outbreak, but by this time we're not. And it's not clear. We have to be aware the system can evolve out from under us. So um, hidden Markov models are one of these things that's arguably a system science technique. It's certainly dynamic. Um, and um, I think it's, it's, it's actually a really nice example for building intuitions with respect to some of the later methods, more sophisticated methods we'll be examining, where we don't just have discrete states, outbreak versus non-outbreak, but we have continuous states. Um, and where we have a more sophisticated way of deducing what state we're in. Um, so uh, it has a lot of commonalities with, with later methods. Um, and we'll be coming back to the intuitions we built here um, to when it comes to some of the, the later methods. Um, we have a dynamical system transitioning between states. Um, uh, going back and forth between states. Each state is a likelihood of observing certain empirical observations. If you're in an outbreak state, you're more likely to observe high ones um, compared to in a non-outbreak state. Um, the, the current state is, we want to estimate what state we're in based on observations, yes. But since they're very ambiguous, we also want to take into account what was it last time? Because that may clue us in a lot to what it is this time. Um, we're estimating the state by attaching a probability of being here or here in light of the observations till this point, and of course, the, the model structure. Um, and you know, we can estimate the probability of being in a current state in light of all data till this point, it's all the data we would know at this point, but retroactively, we might, retrospectively, we might wanna look back and say, what was it at that earlier time? Um, and finally, given state estimates, we can project forward, project the system forward. Um, so what relevance does this have to health conditions. So well, there's a lot of relevance, actually. If you want to infer underlying illness from social media posts, um, you might want to understand this over time. Someone is at any given time sick or not sick, and with a, with a given illness, maybe it's COVID-19, maybe it's uh, depression, maybe it's whether they are suffering from suicidal ideation or what have you. We want to infer that Surely what we've heard from them recently is important, but it might have changed now. And, and any one post might be ambiguous, but gosh, if we've had a bunch of posts recently that are suggestive of a major depressive disorder, maybe it makes it more likely they, they're suffering from it now. Or if we wanna understand outbreak detection, like, like this case I've been talking about, or early stage symptomology or progression of an infection or of a condition. Um, um, if we wanna understand rapid antigen test results, uh, I test myself with a rapid antigen test and um, I assess it now, but it's got some error bars associated with it. And then I assess it tomorrow and it's negative tomorrow, but it was positive today. What's my status tomorrow? It could be a false negative, or um, it's more likely, you know, to be um, the underlying positive since today I was positive. It's somewhat more likely than it would be otherwise that tomorrow it's positive, et cetera. Um, so there's there's many uses of this, um, uh, and you can use this method to go beyond assessing right in which state am I at a, at a given time or was I in earlier to ask what are the sets of states underlying the system? 
how often are the transitions made between the states? How much time do I spend in different states? Do I spend it with major depressive disorder? What's the most likely sequence of states that's, that's, uh, that's applied till now? These are things we can, um, we can find out. Um, now we've applied these for, for many different uses. Um, one of them has been food and more illness outbreaks. Um, uh, some of them have been applied with our smartphone-based data. Uh, for example, understanding the amount of screen time people are getting, or whether someone even has the phone on person or off person to know if the data recorded by the phone, step counts, physical activity levels, contact patterns are representative of that person. And there we might be trying to classify, is it on their person physically or is it off their person is it sitting on a desk, for example? We might want to use cues like, is it horizontal? Is it plugged in? Um, is it moving um, in order to, um, to clue us in to whether it's on person or off person right now? Recognizing there may be brief periods where it's knocked, if, even if it's off person, and that doesn't definitively tell us it's on person, uh, or if it's on person where the person's very still. Okay, so a hidden Markov model involves a set of set of simplifications, and let's talk about that right now, if we could. Um, so um, there's a couple notable simplifications we make with these models. One of them is that um, we assume what are called discrete states, and again, I'm using discrete in a mathematical sense. It's not discrete in the sense of privacy um, or confidentiality. Um, it means, you know, we have a set of account uh, of them, um, set of distinct possibilities. Um, they're categorical or nominal. They're, 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 they're um, a set of, of alternatives. Um, and at any one time, the system is in one particular one of those states. And the current state changes over time. So it may evolve, for example, um, between being in an outbreak state and a non-outbreak state um, for foodborne illness, and then a state here. So we're thinking about a, a municipality. Either there's a foodborne illness outbreak going on or not, and it evolves over time. Um, there may be one right now, but it'll end. There may not be one right now, but another one could begin in some number of weeks. These states are treated as mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. You're, you're in either one or the other. Right now, I've shown dichotomous ones. It doesn't need to be dichotomous. Um, it could be between, again, not infected, asymptomatic, mild, and severe, or between whether the person is, whether the phone is off person or it's on person, the person's sitting down, or they're lying down, or they're standing, or they're engaged in some sort of active activity, walking, biking, whatever, running. Um, for simplicity here, I have had, I'm writing it, I'm giving dichotomous examples, but that's more for simplicity of, of exposition, wanting to convey something that's simpler in walking before we run. Um, so that's one simplification is discrete states. Discrete set of possibilities. Any one time you're in one of a set of possibilities. Mm. Um, major depressive disorder, minor depressive disorder, um, or, or no, no, uh, uh, no, no depression at all. Um, another simplification is we have discrete time, um, meaning we have, it's not continuous. We don't have like, you know, um, down to a very extraordinarily fine-grained level. It's not like we're saying it's 135.25 uh, seconds uh, into the day. It's, you know, um, uh, you know, one hour, 36 minutes, point four or five seconds than today. It's, time is divided into equally sized time steps. For some models, it might be one day. You know, we consider day by day at a time. 
all uniformly spaced. Or maybe it's weeks. Or maybe for some models, it will be seconds. Um, in some of our models, it might be a 30 second interval. Depends on your needs, but it's, it's a set of discrete epochs of fixed length. And for each time step, each epoch, um, uh, there's exactly one observation at each type. We'll treat it now. Um, there are generalizations that can handle more general cases, but for now we'll say there's exactly one observation of each type. Um, and so maybe there's one observation of clinical cases and another observation of subclinical cases. Um, or maybe for each you know, day that a person is sick, we have their temperature and we have the result from a rapid antigen test. Um, and, you know, we have a, um, a result that indicates whether or not they're feeling fatigue. We're trying to judge whether they have COVID-19 or not. Um, um, we can handle no observations by having a no observation category that is possible. Um, and the system is in exactly one state at a time and transitions kind of occur instantaneously after that. So that's another simplification, discrete states, discrete times. Uh, another one that might seem a little bit um, elusive uh, is the idea that states are memoryless. And what I mean by that is um, the chance of leaving a state is viewed as independent of how long you've been there. So your chance of going from, at any one time, going from an, out, uh, an outbreak state to a non-outbreak state is viewed as independent of how long you've been there. Now, if it depends on how long you're out there, if you want to make it so that, look, very few outbreaks last more than two weeks um, because of the way the food supply chain works or what have you, that you know a load of contaminated beef you know, will will be used up by that time, um, you know, two weeks in, it'll be out of all the, will be served and, and there'll be no more illness from it. Um, if you wanna say that it, you know, we wanna limit it to two weeks or make it less and less like you just split the state up into several states, outbreak week one, outbreak week two, outbreak week three, each of which is memoryless, but where, you know, the further you go on the number of weeks, maybe the more likely it is you go to a non-outbreak state. So you just break the state up until it's memoryless. This is very similar to what we do in system dynamics as well. System dynamics, those compartments are memoryless. Uh, if we need them to be memory full, if we need that to have transition dynamics that depend on how long you've been in one of those states, you just break it up into pieces. So it's at a practical level, it's not that big a challenge. It's a little bit awkward, that's all. It's a bit, it's a bit annoying to have to do it. Um, uh, now, beyond this, um, uh, with, we have observations. And, and the observation is contingent on the state. So I want to draw back to that example here we, we started with, with outbreak and non-outbreak. So, while you're, whilst you're in the outbreak state, you have certain observations are more likely than others. You have a, you have a certain distribution of possible values for, for a number of clinical cases and number of subclinical cases, these cases that don't bring people to the physician. Um, and so it is with, with non-outbreak state, you have a different distribution. So the idea here is how many clinical people, how many people are reported as being in a clinical state, you know, with highly credible gastrointestinal illness, um, possibly attributable to, to foodborne illness outbreak will depend on the state. If you go to a different state, it'll be different. But contention on being in that state, we hold that it's, it's independent. Each observation is independent of, of the last one successive observations while you're in a given state are held to be independent. They're independent and identically distributed from that distribution. So while we're in the outbreak state, 
we'll draw from this distribution for each one, but we don't have to remember what the last one was and say this one will be higher because the last one was was uh, was high, you know, as well. Or no, no, no. As long as you're in the upbreak state, you just draw from this distribution on. And again, if that's not the case, if it gets worse while you're in the outbreak state over time, then break it into several pieces. There's early outbreak and late outbreak. It's the same thing we do in other sorts of modeling. We break you know, the state of having TB into successive pieces where you're more and more severe TB symptoms as time goes on for cavitary TB eventually, et cetera. Um, so we have the observations going on when we're in a state. The idea is that each state has a certain likelihood of observing certain values. Um, and what value, you know, what values obtained while in that state is, is independent, uh, excuse me, it, it, those values are independent, identically distributed while in that state. Mm. Um, that's the idea. Uh, so these are a set of simplifications and those allow a formal specification. And again, I, I warned, we started this out um, for those who are here. I warned, you know, this is going to have some uh, a bit of formality to it. We're going to be um, uh, using a, a more formal characterization here, and here it is. Um, so we'll we'll start to get a little bit more formal, and there'll be matrices coming up. And just bear in mind, some of you will be more comfortable with those than others. Those that don't, I'll, I'll be trying to convey the intuition nonetheless. Um, uh, so we have a set of possible states S. This is some set. We have a set of possible observations, number of clinical cases, number of subclinical cases, X. I'll have an observation, each of those observations, no matter what state we're in each time. Mm. Um, and then we have a transition matrix, which says, if you're in one state now, what's your probability of going to this other state? And I could describe it as a matrix, but I think it's much easier to look at visually. Um, so if I'm in a state, imagine I, I want to model using smartphone data. Is this, is this person carrying the smartphone? Are they likely to be smoking right now? Are they likely to be vaping right now or engaged in no use? Maybe it's data from a wearable, you know, on their wrist. And if they're smoking, they're moving their wrist like that. If they're vaping, they're also using this, but maybe for much longer periods. If they're not using, we won't see that. And it's a bit ambiguous because, you know, um, maybe they're eating right? um, at the same time and we want to distinguish this. So maybe we have a hidden Markov model for whether they're vaping, smoking, or engaged in neither of those. And these are the states. They're in any one of them at a given time. They're, collect they're mutually exclusive, collectively exhausted. They're in one and exactly one at any time. And then, and we're considering one minute at a time. And, you know, if it's a mixture, we'll just describe, you know, whatever one they started at for that minute. They're, we consider the state or what have you. Um, Contingent on being in a state, if they're in a state of no use, they have a certain probability of staying in that state, transitioning to the same state, point of 99%, 0.99. They have a 0.3% chance, a 0.3% chance of going to the smoking state per minute in, in the next minute, and a 0.07 chance of going to the vaping state in the next minute. That's this row. Those have to sum to one because they got to go to some state in the next minute. So this sums up to one. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the state they're in right now. And this is the probability of going to each of these other states in the next minute. And they have to go to one. So it has to sum up to one. If they're in the smoking state right now, maybe they have a 0.18 chance of staying smoking. And, um, and then they, uh, and they have a 0.8 chance if they're smoking, excuse me, uh, they have 0.8 chance uh, of, of, so an 80% chance of just staying smoking, a 0.18 chance of going to no use, and a 0.02 chance of firing up the vapor 
because maybe uh, someone who someone shows up that that wants to vape with them instead of smoke, and so they 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 vape instead, or maybe they they burn through the cigarette and they say, oh, now I want to vape. Um, I I, I want to get some more nicotine, and they they start vaping. Or whatever. So this is a hidden Markov model of this, and and we're and suppose we want to just you know try to use this to figure out at any one point what what state are they in, right? Um, okay, so um, uh, we're going to be talking about observation probabilities. P is a state, X is an observation. It's a little bit confusing because often we like Y as an observation. So this kind of sticks to my craw, but um, but I can live with that. Um, and we'll have some maximum time T, and and this will be the observation at time I. In general, maybe a vector of observations, an observation for the number of clinical cases and the number of subclinical or what have you. And P of X given S is the probability of observing X given that it's currently in state S. So we have observation probabilities. So given if we're in a state, what's the, um, what's the chance of observing something? So we saw this earlier with this one, right? Given that we're in an outbreak state, What's the probability of observing a certain number of clinical cases? That's what I mean. What's the probability of observing a given, of making a given observation about clinical cases when we're in the state or about subclinical? And in general, we're talking about a, of a combination of clinical and subclinical. What's the probability of observing that given that we're in the outbreak state? Mm. That's what we're trying to understand here. Um, uh, so those are the observation probabilities. Given that I'm in a state, what's the chance that I'll make a certain observation? And that's going to be important. Why is it going to be important? Because gosh, if, if that's really low, that we have a certain probability of observing this thing while we're in this state, then if we see that thing whose probability is really low, it, Make clue us in we're not in this state, we're in some other state. Mm. So it, it could start to clue us in to, to being in another state. Um, okay, so there's two ways in which we use these hidden Markov models. So if we define them this way, there's, there's two ways in which we use them. Um, uh, one is a supervised way and one is an unsupervised way. I, I introduced those terms yesterday. Um, uh, and um, generally we want to train it in some way, and then we want to apply it. Those are two broad phases of use. We train it and we test it as, as well. I should say train and test. So it's train and, oh, and then test. And then we apply it. We're going to apply it again and again. The model is formulated and we're going to apply it. That's the idea here. Now, the, the traditional technique of training and testing involves this, and, and machine learning involves cross-validation. I spoke about that yesterday. Remember this rotation estimation. We divide the data set up into pieces for any one, for, for, for those pieces. Um, we, we rotate among treatments of dividing up into test and training sets. So we have a set of training ones and we separate out a test set. So we train it on all of these, we get it performing really good and all those learning from those. And then we test it on this one and see how well it does when on data it's never been told about. And then we do it with a different subset of the data, different division of the data being used for training and testing. And we do it again and again in this k-fold cross-validation. Mm. And that's good. But the problem is here, we have temporal data. We don't have data that can just be divided up because after all, the, the whole job of, the, of this model, of the hidden Markov model is to process time series of data, observations over time in a continuous sequence. We can't just take, pluck out a test set in the middle because you know, we, we want to train it somehow with these, but those are after that time. We, we can't do that. 
So instead, what we do is we'll often do something like this. And this is something Xia Yan does all the time, for example. We'll take the, the data, we'll divide it into a training prefix. We train it on these. And then we test it on these um, going forward. Uh, see how well it performs going forward. We train it on these and we test it on these and so on. Um, uh, if you can't run it forward all this way, you just test it on, on these. So you have sort of different lengths of, of, of prefix, as it were. Um, OK, um, so what we're going to be examining is this case of foodborne illness outbreaks. We're going to have one week outbreaks, and um, we're going to be trying to classify whether there's an outbreak going on right now based on observations and based on system structure. So we're going to be, we're going to have a, a model which encodes these transitions and encodes these observations. Um, and um, here we have uh, uh, a state A, a non-outbreak state, a state B, an outbreak state. And um, we're going to try to use this model and for the most basic task for hidden Markov models, I'll, I'll give reference, remind you of some of the more sophisticated ones, um, which involve like estimation of the transition probability. So the number of states or the shape of these curves. But for now, we're going to confine ourselves to a much more modest task. We're going to take this model and we're going to use it to ask at any one time what was going on then, or what is going on right now? Are we in an outbreak state right now or a non-outbreak state right now? For example, given all the data we've seen till now, up till now, do we think right now we're in an outbreak state or in a non-outbreak state? Mm -hmm. uh, that's our goal. Um, and it's a bit ambiguous. Remember these, these observations may, have, may, may remind you, um, and I apologize, I'm gonna go back because some of you were not present at this, this point in the uh, presentation. I mean, I need to make this point importantly. They're ambiguous observations. I had made this in, the, in, the, in this slide here. We have ambiguous observations. At any one time, we may get a report of the number of clinical cases, but you know, that report is not gonna tell us immediately which, whether we have an outbreak or not. It, it might be a bit more likely given this that we're in an outbreak state if we have like 11 cases, but it's not a surefire thing. It's quite, quite possible we're in a non outbreak state, the blue curve. The blue curve is just a little bit shifted relative to the, to the red curve and, and a little bit similar thing here, although a bit more shifted. And so if we have any given observation here, say of 80 cases, well, yeah, it's more likely we're in an outbreak, but it's still quite likely we're in a non outbreak state. We, can't rule it out. So any one observation here, any one observation here is ambiguous. And we're trying to figure out, gosh, if we have 15 cases now, and if this is our history, you know, are we in an outbreak state or not? So in an outbreak state, we might expect a distribution like this, which it's generally it's of higher values, for example. Suppose we're, for simplicity, we're just doing clinical cases. We might expect on average, maybe there's 26 people sick per week in our municipality, whereas if it's non-outbreak, we don't expect, you know, somewhere in the teens. Um, but uh, just because we get 15 doesn't mean that's not possible here. It is possible we're in an outbreak state 15. We just, you know, it's a lucky week. We're, we're, we're a lucky outbreak and people weren't, you know, going out needing as much or we just didn't get the reports or something like that from them. Um, so maybe maybe we were lucky. We want to know at any one state, what are we in? And any given observation is ambiguous. It could result from either of these. Um, we'd, we'd like to know what it was before. Gosh, it was very unlikely we were in an outbreak state a week ago. And surely that's going to that's gonna be considered in our assessment of the likelihood of being in an outbreak state right now, because if we were in a non-outbreak state last week, we only have a 
10% chance of having transitioned to an outbreak state. So in, in trying to balance, are we in an outbreak state now? We're gonna look at the observation, 15 here, but we're also gonna consider the context. Like what was it last time? Were we really unlikely last week to be in an outbreak state? If so, we're kind of less likely than we might think from the observation to be in a non-outbreak, to be in an outbreak state. And we need to balance all these things. And that is exactly what the hidden Markov model formalism does. So um, imagine, and I'm gonna walk you through the underlying situation. You know, at any one time, there's a true situation. And maybe at the start, we had, we were, it truly was in an outbreak set. We don't know this, this is kind of the God's eye view, right? It's like. We don't know what the situation was there, um, but um, uh, what? But if it were this, and it was in an outbreak state. Um, you know, we could imagine if 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 we have perfect knowledge of it, it was in an outbreak state, and there were thirty one observations. Um, so, in other words, thirty one people reported highly credible gastrointestinal illness um, consistent with foodborne illness that week. The next next week. It was truly in a non-outbreak state. We only had 16, okay? Um, it could have come from an outbreak state, but it, we, we know the true situation was, if, if the true situation was this, maybe we have 16 here and you know 10 here. These are just drawn from this distribution, right? This is the true underlying situation is the idea. We'd love to know what this true underlying situation is, but we don't have direct privileged access to it. This is what we're trying to infer. This is kind of our model of the situation. If we're in an outbreak state, we're drawing from this distribution. If we're in a non-outbreak state, we're drawing from that one. And we're transitioning over time with these probabilities given by this mumble probability matrix that somehow um, somehow got, got too, um, too far to the right here, a um, little bit like the US. Um, okay, so uh, there we go. Um, okay, um, so so if we are currently in a non-outbreak state, um, we have a 0.9 chance of staying there and a 0.1 chance of going to an outbreak state. And if we're in a, an outbreak state now, we have a 0.3 chance uh, of transitioning to non-outbreak and otherwise 0.7 chance of staying in outbreak. That's how to read that. And we're calling this, calling this tau. That's a, for those not, not, not up for whom this, um, it's all Greek to you. Um, that's a, a Greek letter tau there, and I'll put it in blue. Um, okay. Um, so this is the underlying situation that we posits going on. You know, there's an underlying system at any one time, it's in a state, conditional being in a state, it's producing draws from that, that distribution for that state, and it's transitioning among states of, over time. You know, it's in an outbreak state, and it transitions to a non-outbreak state, and then it transitions back to an <laughs> I'm glad someone got that, got that uh, quote. Um, I think the hearings are just over here. Um, I am a dual citizen after all. Um, okay, so uh, we want to ask, um, uh, you know, how, how plausible is it that a given HMM uh, explains this data? What's the most plausible model? Um, uh, and given a plausible model, what's the likely underlying situation at a given point? Um, so, uh, you know, if, if we have a plausible model, what state are we in at a, at a given time? Um, and so there's, there's two algorithms that are used. It turns in, in hidden Markov models, forward backward algorithms and perturbi algorithms. Forward backward algorithm asks us, what's the probability that we're in uh, a given state at a given time? Take into account all data till then, and then all data um, from then forward if, we, if we're looking retrospectively. There's a forward pass that computes the probability just using past data. And there's a, a, a backward pass that combines it with the forward one to say, 
you know, retrospectively, given all the data, what was likely going on at that early in time? Was there an outbreak or not? Um, was there a crime being committed by the White House or not? Given all the data we knew till then and, and since then. Um, uh, so um, uh, the Viterbi algorithm goes beyond that and asks, what's the most likely sequence of data? Um, so there's two modes of training these, and I'm not going to go into this much. Just, just be aware that hidden Markov models um, can be used in, an, in a supervised way where we actually know the true situation for a certain number of cases, and we use that to, to deduce the structure of the model, to, to infer the structure of the model directly. We come up with a model that can explain that, and then we can apply it to figure out on other sources of data whether or not we're, we have an outbreak at a given time. So given some labeled data, some ground truth data, some, some correct data where we know the underlying situation, we could come up with a very powerful model that will allow us from then on to, to consider data and, and classify. But most commonly used is unsupervised learning. And here we have unlabeled observations. We're not in a privileged status where we know the true situation. No, 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 no. Um, uh, we, we just have unlabeled observations and we're inferring the HMM structure that best explains this data. The data whispers to us about some hidden structure underlying it. Its dynamics tell us about this structure and we're deducing what the structure is. Even some things as basic as how many states there are or what's the transition matrix between the states, how quickly they go from one to the other. Um, often we start with positing that, but there are ways of using this to try to infer that. Our job right here is, is simpler. We're just given a, a certain structure that we're going to, um, we're going to parameterize and assume, we're going to ask, what's the likelihood we're in a given state at a given time? And we're going to see how to do that. And, and again, um, I, I, you know, this has content which is going to be more, uh, it's going to speak to those from mathematical background, uh, especially well coming up. And I'll ask others to, to just remember the intuitions here. And I'll try to explain that. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so... So this is the true underlying situation. The, I say no, actually, it's true underlying situation. This is what we kind of posit is secretly going on. And we're, we're trying to deduce it. We're, we, we'd like to kind of try to figure out what this is. So we're going we're gonna to posit this and, and try to understand. Forward, no, no, su, uh, good question from, from Hind. No, supervised learning and unsupervised uh, learning will both yield uh, models, which can and then be used with the Viterbi algorithm or the forward backwards algorithm. This issue is orthogonal to, it's separate from the issue of how the model was trained. This is about how to train a good model, um, uh, whether you're training it with, with uh, unlabeled data or with labeled data. Once you have a model um, trained in whatever way, you can run it with the forward backwards algorithm to calculate the probability of the system being in a given, given state at a given time, given the data till then, or given the data till then and the data later. Or, or you can run it with Viterbi algorithm to find the single most likely set of sequence of states um, that, that occurred over time. Those can be applied with a model coming from either supervised or unsupervised. Yeah. Um, okay. So this is where it, you know, it gets a bit more mathematically involved. Um, I used to work in Africa uh, for several summers uh, as a field school assistant, and um, uh, I um, came very close to several um, uh, deadly poisonous snakes, and that process. And um, uh, I was told um, when it comes to uh, poisonous snakes, I was in Northern Africa, Turkana area, uh, near the border of, of uh, Kenya and, and Ethiopia. Um, and 
I was told that when it comes to poisonous snakes, um, uh, if you yell snake, there's a there's two reactions people have. Um, half half of the group will tend to run away from the snake, and the other half of the group tends to run towards the snake <laughs> to see it. Um, and sometimes I kind of feel like that in my boot camps, where if I show math, half the group says, "Oh, tell me more. This looks great." Um, now now I now I'm getting it, and and half runs away. So um, uh, so you know. We'll, we'll, we'll bear with bear with the group and I'll try to give lots of intuition here for the, the Greek letters. But for some people, this will this will be really eye-opening because it, it starts to get crunchy and, and you know very specific. Okay, so the idea here is we have a, a certain probability. Here it's in a delta, but it, we're also writing it pi. It's the same thing. It's a probability of being in each state. And then we're going to have a probability for each possible state of observing the first uh, the first observation. And there'll be a transition matrix and the probability of observing the second observation, et cetera. And this is what's called the forward probabilities. I'm going to explain where this comes from in just a minute, give the intuitions with this, how this all plays out. But the idea is that this is going to tell us um, the probability of having observed the sequence this number of clinical cases in week one, that number of clinical cases in week two, that number of clinical cases in week three, et cetera. Um, given that you're now in a certain state um, at time t, okay? Um, uh, so, so given that you're now in the outbreak state, what was the likelihood that you consistently saw a very low number of, of um, clinical cases till now? Well, it's not a very high probability. Um, what's the likelihood you would have observed low cases early and then higher ones? Well, that's much more likely, right? Um, what's the probability that you observe consistently high states? Well, it's possible, but it's kind of unlikely we would have you know, stayed in this, this outbreak state for so long. After all, we, if we're in an outbreak state, we have a 30% chance per week of leaving it. Um, but it's, it's possible. And so this is going to be a probability vector. It's called alpha. Just, just remember alpha. Alpha, ladies and gentlemen, is your friend. Um, take it from me. He's my friend, and, or she's my friend, and she's a good friend. Um, um, so um, this is a very regular structure that occurs in HMFs. And basically, it says, it lets us say, you know, given we're in a certain state now. What's the probability of having observed that? And that's it's going to be super important because we can turn it around and start to say, well, what's the prob? Given that we have seen this sequence, what's the probability we are in that state right now, in this state versus that state versus that state? If we can say for a given state, what's the probability we would have seen those observations? You know, through Bayes's theorem, we can turn it around Bayes's rule. We can turn it around and then say, okay, you know, given that I have in fact seen this sequence, what's the probability right now I'm in these given states? Well, this is going to be denoted by alpha. So, so let's consider this. Let's suppose we have, let's assume we have a probability of 0.75 of starting um, in the non-outbreak state. That's this one here, and uh, 0.25 of starting here. 25% chance of starting at outbreak state, 75% here. Okay. Um, that's this pi thing. Um, um, okay. Um, um, great. Um, now, now suppose that we have an observation. Oh my gosh, we have an observation of 31. What's the probability in light of that? Our updated sense of which state we're in. Well, initially we thought we had a 75% chance we were here, but now we see this, this really high observation, just chance, gosh, if we're in an on outbreak state, it's really, really low. So this P sub A of 31, probably of observing 31, given that we're in this state here, this low outbreak state is, is very, very small. So, so this is gonna become very small because we're gonna, when we thought we had a, it was a good chance we were starting there, but now we say, you know, 
not a chance in hell we're, we're in, in that state now. Whereas this one has a probability of 0.25 times, you know, this um, probability of, of B of observing 31, which is, is far, far higher. Um, and, and so here we have a much, much higher state, um, a much higher relative probability to this one. Normally, we'd actually have to do what's called normalize it, divided by the sum of both of these. But the, the point is, this is going to be a lot higher than this one. We, we thought we, it was more likely we were starting here, but this observation makes it vanishingly unlikely we are here. So this is going to be very, very small, and this will be small. And this one will be much, much more likely, even though it had a 0.25 in front of it. It's much, much more likely. Um, uh, but now we have to consider, we need to reason about the first state transition. This was just, you know, we see a, an observation and we, we update our sense of where we are, right? That's, that's what this was. We saw an observation based on, we're still in the initial state, we see an observation, we're updating our sense of where we are. And that clues us in, hey, we're probably in this outbreak state. But now guess what? Things change. So even if we are here, Gosh, we have a 30% chance per week of going over to the non-outbreak state. Okay. Um, so now what's our chance of ending up after that transition in the non-outbreak state, um, uh, each non-outbreak state? Well, gosh, um, if we were in this state initially, I know it's very unlikely, um, uh, and we, we can, well, if we consider ways we could be in state A, this, this non outbreak state, um, after this transition, there's two ways we could have gotten there. There's two ways we could be here at, after the first transition. One is we started here and stayed there, right? That's what this one is. We, we started there and we stayed there. Mm. Um, that's one way we could have been there. We, we, we were there already and we started there and stayed there. Okay, that's one way we could be there. The other way we could be there is we were here in the initial state, which started to seem a lot more likely after that first observation. And then we moved over to this non-outbreak state. And that's, gosh, that's a 30% chance per week we, we went over there. So that's what this one is. So if we kind of total those up, the probability we are in that state here, you know, times the probability we, we stayed in that state plus the probability we are here um, um, as informed by this observation, that's, that's what this is, times the probability then of going from that state um, uh, to this other state, we get this probability. Mm, that's a sum of these probabilities of all the ways we could be here um, now. We could have been there from the get-go, or we could have been here from the get-go and, and uh, sorry, from the start and then transitioned over. That's that's what that is. And this, mm, that's all the ways we could be here. Well, okay, one possibility is we we actually started here. This doesn't seem that likely given this. I mean, the chance we saw this observation way out here is so unlikely, but it's possible. So we could have, we could have. Been, been there and then transitioned to here, uh, or we could have started here, seeming a lot more likely in light of this first observation, and then we stayed there. And after all, we do have a 70% chance of staying here. So for all those, we could, we could be in state two here. Um, and so after that transition, this is the, the probably we're, in each of these states, so the relative probability. We can renormalize it to get a full probability. So that's the idea. And then, and, and guess what? That's that first two, these components of the horrible expression that, well, maybe for you it was horrible. Maybe for others, it's beautiful. Um, what a beautiful snake. Um, green and gold and glittery. Um, so that's these first components. We had the probability of being in each initial state. We took into account the first observation. There we go. Um, and that changed our probability of, of being in each of these states. And then we transitioned, right? And, and that's what each of these things were. We multiply it by the transition. Mm -mm. There we are. And guess what? Now it's just more of the same. 
It's just more of the same. Now we have the second observation. Here we go. Here we go. We have the second observation. And that's going to skew. This is what we think it is before the observation. This is a Bayesian framework. This is what we think it is, the probabilities are before the observation. And then we've got to take into account this observation. Guess what? It's a 16. Gosh, we could still be in this, in this outbreak state. It could just be a low roller. Um, um, here we could still be in an outbreak state um, um, times this probability here, but you know we could also, in fact, now um, uh, it's it's more likely from the observation that we're here, and and um, maybe this probability was was not really high, but this observation makes it more likely that um, that in fact we 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 have transitioned to the non-outbreak state that we went in fact like that. Maybe initially we were here, that initial observation made it clear, but now maybe we went like this and that's why we got the 16. But you know, it's ambiguous. Maybe we're still in the outbreak state and the 16 is it's just, it was a, was a low ball um, an, an estimate. Okay, so then we do it again, right? Um, we do it again, it's just more of the same, we just, and do these things again. So we've taken into account this probability and then we consider how we move um, uh, between these. And, and that's what these are. And, and on and on she goes, on and on she goes. And each of these is computing the probability or relative probability, I'm not getting into renormalizing, of being in each state at each time informed by successively more observations and then in by informed by the possibility that we moved. So this is a way of sort of keeping track of where, you know, what's the probability we're in each state as more and more information unfolds, more and more observations, and as the states can change out from under us. Maybe we know where we, we're pretty darn sure where we were at the start based on this initial observation. But then ba boom, this now we have to worry about that we might have transitioned out and that second observation is starting to make that look more likely. Um, and then we see a third observation and oh my gosh, it's a 10. The chance of having observed that if we're still in an outbreak state is very low. We're giving more and more credibility that we're now, we have indeed transitioned to a non-outbreak state. That, that's what's going on here we're taking into account this unfolding data and taking into account the dynamics of the system. And at each time point, we're, we're attaching a probability to the chance we're in this state or that state, bearing in mind that some of that is boosted if we were in this state last time and, and we have a high chance of staying in that state, but it's also boosted if we're getting an observation very consistent with the state. So for some of you, maybe you're eating this math up. For others of you, maybe you're, you're not eating it up. Um, but um, the, the basic picture here is that we're balancing the information we get from the observations, taking into account the probability, if we're in each state, that we'd observe that observation. And we're taking into account the dynamics and the fact that, you know, even if we were in this state last time, we still have a 30% chance of leaving it. Um, whereas if we were in this state the last time, we have a 90% chance of staying there, only a 10% chance of leaving it. And HMM balances all of that. And it's computing here this probability that we're in each state at, at a given time, given all the observations till that. That's this alpha thing. And that's what's computed in this forward backwards algorithm. The forwards part just computes alpha. It computes probably we're in a state at a given time, given all the data till then, but only up till then. Now the backwards pass takes into account all the data after that point. Of course, if, if I'm a public health official, I'm trying to judge, you know, is there a foodborne illness outbreak in Saskatoon right now? All I have access to is the data till now, right? But if 
a year from now, we're doing a forensic investigation as to what was going on earlier and why these people, you know, um, died from food, foodborne illness um, uh, earlier. We might want to analyze all the data since then and say, when did that foodborne illness outbreak likely start? And when did it finish? Because we want to do better next time. We want to be able to, um, uh, to, to you know, um, assess at what week it began and what week it ended. And we want to learn how long it went on so that we could figure out why it went on for that long and, and cut it short uh, in the future. You know, did it involve multiple shipments of ground beef or what have you? Um, so this is the idea of the forwards backwards algorithm. And it's a basic algorithm in this. It's supported by HMM libraries within R. And if there were interest here, we could show you some HMM code. And in fact, I think I may have already posted some code, but I could walk through it if, if there were interest to kind of walk through how you assess this. It's quite straightforward in R to build a little HMM, feed it data, have it run this algorithm and assess at every given point, what's the most likely probability you were in this state or that state. Um, the Viterbi algorithm is, is the other really big algorithm with this, um, with hidden Markov models. The Viterbi algorithm um, gives you something that might seem to be the same thing, but it's actually not, it's actually not. It estimates the single most likely sequence of latent states over time that are consistent with the observations. The alpha beta, the forward backwards algorithm, um, will give you the probability of being in a given state at a given time. Um, but that doesn't tell you what the, the single sequence was, the single trajectory of what happened at each time. It doesn't give you a consistent story necessarily. You may get the highest probability of being in a given state as, as a certain state, but um, at the previous time before that, it might've been another state, but there's no way of going from that earlier state to this state, um, to the single most likely ones. We're looking for a single story that's most consistent with the data. No outbreak, no outbreak, no outbreak, 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 outbreak for those weeks, no outbreak, no outbreak, 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 no outbreak, et cetera. We're looking for a single story. And, and this will be the same when we get to some of the later approaches, particularly particle filtering and particle on CPC. We'll talk about the trajectories measured by this system. Those systems are much more sophisticated. They deal with continuous states that we could be in and estimating them. But their, their basic motivation and, and considerations and so on are very, very similar here. And the basic idea of wanting a, a trajectory, a sequence of, of situations, a story is the same. Um, so, um, so this uh, can be computed and, and HMM libraries will compute this for you. Um, now, um, uh, the, the, um, when, when we're assessing these, these are the most basic things we compute with a hidden Markov model. We have a hidden Markov model, we trained it, we apply it to data and it tells us the probability we're in an outbreak state right now or the probability we're in an outbreak state the previous week. Mm. Um, uh, it could tell us it using only the data till now or the data from later, or it'll tell us the most likely sequence of states. That's pretty cool. Um, it can give us a probability someone online is in a major, suffering major depressive disorder, or online is, is, is suffering from suicidal ideation, taking into account their posts from over multiple areas of time, or maybe, um, the, the likelihood someone carrying a phone has fallen and, and is in need of help or something along those lines, or a municipality is, is, is experiencing an out, out outbreak. But um, um, you can do a lot more than that with HMMs. And I could show code where, for example, we, what we identify is actually the most likely HMM. The hidden Markov model structure that best matches that data. So there we're deducing from observations, unlabeled, we're deducing an HMM structure. We're finding the most likely HMM that explains that data. Um, we're comparing different HMMs, different parameter values 
maybe different transition matrices, different assumptions about how in, a, in, a, in an outbreak state, how many cases you have, the, the shape of this probability distribution or that one. And we're, we're deducing that from observations. That's pretty cool. Uh, um, but we can also deduce things like um, the, the probability we start um, in, a, in a given state or um, uh, the, the probability of observing a certain thing, yeah, the probability of observing a certain thing being in a certain state. So, so this is kind of cool. And, and you know, the, often we will come up with an HMM that best explains the data. Um, so um, I had a question, how do you decide which algorithm to choose? I think you're talking about Viterbi Verge versus, uh, versus Ford's backwards. Um, yeah, so the needs are different. So if your needs, if you wanna have a single consistent story, you wanna say, when did the outbreak stop, start? When did it stop, for example? Um, uh, you would use a Viterbi algorithm. Um, you're looking for a single story coming up. If you wanna ask, what's the probability right now we're in an outbreak, and you're not concerned about having a consistent story all the way through time, until um, now, et cetera, uh, forward backwards algorithm will, will give you what you want. Um, uh, that, that will tell you, you know, given all the data till now, are you likely in an outbreak or not? Um, so it, it really is looking what you're hoping to take away from it. You're hoping to take away a probabilistic assessment of what's going on now, or an assessment of the story of the trajectory over time of what is a complete consistent story of what's happened till now, okay? Then it, we would choose one versus the other algorithm based on that. And these are very well supported algorithms. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, so um, a few caveats here. Hidden Markov models um, are a great start. They build these intuitions, and particularly these intuitions that I noted, um, you know, that are, are in common with later methods. Um, you know, states have likelihoods of each state is a likelihood of observing different empirical observations. Contingent on being in a certain state, you have a different likelihood of observing certain things. If you're in outbreak state, you're going to see more sick people um, generated than if you're in a non-outbreak state on, a, on average, et cetera. Um, you're going to estimate how you know brings up the question: How do we estimate the current state using, you know, uh, not just data from the world, each of which is noisy, ambiguous, etc., but also model expectations? Um, estimate what state we're in, not just based on the latest observation, but what's gone on recently. If if last um, last time point last week we were very likely in an outbreak state. It really boosts our chance of thinking we're in an outbreak state now, even if we have a modest level of observation, for example. Um, or if we were in a non-outbreak state last time, for sure, and we get a very ambiguous observation now, it may say uh, you're in a non-outbreak state very likely still. So we're trying to take into account data, but also the dynamics of the situation, the evolving character of the situation. Um, we're estimating the state by attaching a probability of being in different states. Uh, we're, we're trying to say, what is the probability of being in this state or that state or that state right now? Um, um, this idea of estimating the probability of being in a current state using just past data or both past and present data. Um, and finally, given state estimates now, we can actually project the state forward and say, what are we, what's the state likely to be next week, for example? Um, but hidden Markov models are not a panacea. They're not for everything. Uh, um, they're not gonna be the right tool if you have continuous states. The number of people who are infected or asymptomatically infected in our population we might treat that as continuous. It's not discrete, you know, um, are they severe, mild or critical or non-infected at all? Or, or, you know, are they sitting, standing, walking, lying down? Are they in a major depressive disorder, um, uh, borderline uh, depression, or no depression at all? Um, uh, if you have memory full states, um, well, again, I, mean, I would say that you can split those. Um, um, and it turns out HMMs are so simple 
they're at the kind of boundary of system science methods. Um, they're not nonlinear. We have a very simple model where the probability of going from one state to the next is independent um, uh, of um, you know, how long you've been in that state. Um, and uh, this does not allow for considering nonlinearity like we have with infectious diseases where you know, um, it, for someone to get sick, um, it depends not only the number of susceptibles that there are, the probability, you know, the number of people getting sick per unit time depends not only on the number of susceptibles, but the number of infectives as well. And we, we're not gonna have that with hidden Markov models. Um, dynamic models, um, agent-based models, discrete event simulation models, um, models which are, which are um, system dynamics or compartmental models um, add um, uh, a lot more. They add dependence of transition probabilities to the state of the system. Um, they add the support for um, continuous states. That first one is important. Um, you know, having the probability of going from one state to another depending on the state of the system and be depending on other people's state is, is, is valuable. Um, with a foodborne illness outbreak, my chance of having foodborne illnesses more or less um, uh, is not affected by you, whether or not you have it right now. But um, for many conditions, we do have that effect. You, you know, mental health conditions like depression or, or, um, or communicable illness. Um, HMMs uh, or just dynamic models support continuous states, continuous time. Um, memory full states and richer contexts like networks, geography. Uh, despite these limitations, HMMs are really powerful tools. They can be very useful. And in our work, we've used them a lot, assessing screen time, um, looking at foodborne illness outbreaks, uh, looking at uh, activity you know, issues with sedentary behavior and types of activities. So they can be very useful. Um, um, I asked, you mentioned supervised means labeled and unsupervised is unlabeled. Um, um, yeah, so, so these were terms uh, which I mentioned yesterday, but it, it, it bears um, emphasis. So when we're dealing with supervised um, learning, um, in order to undertake supervised learning, we need data that's been ground truth where we have a, the true situation is known. We're going to be taking some examples and training it um, against those examples, which are reliably, as we say, labeled. Um, they're, they're classified already. So we have data, perhaps with, with time series, where we know whether, you know, for a given year, whether or not there's a foodborne illness outbreak going on in that year. We classify that. Um, we know through other considerations and we use that to train our model. Um, or maybe we know for a given person through other clinical information or information collected from them and in and, and, and discussion with them, we know whether or not they were suffering depression at different times and we have their tweets at those different times. And we use them to train the hidden Markov model. So supervised learning requires as a fundamental prerequisite data that is correctly classified. And we use that correctly classified data to then figure out a general approach that doesn't require, um, that, that can be fed data that's unlabeled in the future and come up with the right answer. It's just that we, we are learning from data that's classified correctly and we're training it based on that data. And so that's why we need labels. In other words, ground truth, things where we know the correct answer. That's what I mean by labeled data. It's, it's been labeled with the true answer. Um, and unsupervised methods, which are the dominant methods with hidden Markov models, don't require that. They, they just have a set of observations and you can come up with the most likely HMM given those observations, for example, um, without requiring anyone to say what the true situation was at any one time for even a subset of the data. 
I hope that's helpful. Okay, any other questions people would like to ask? Hidden Markov models, regardless of whether or not the math sunk in here, they provide a really useful um, uh, point of intuition for drawing on for, uh, for coming, uh, coming lectures uh, as we go into additional and more sophisticated techniques. So any questions? Okay, um, so um, I'm gonna 